McCarty, host of the Dining Diva Show. Today with me, I have Matt Carmony, and we are looking at urban keep beekeeping. I'm so excited to be here. I feel like my hat is falling down over my eyes. But for our viewers, tell us, you live within the city limits of Canton, Ohio, right. and you've got three, three mm -hmm. hives right. here. Um, can you tell us how do you get started? What, what if somebody wanted to open a hive in their own backyard? How do they start? Well, you would first want to get the appropriate equipment uh, to house bees. Basically, a bee home is a box uh, that has um, a frame in which the bees can build their honeycomb uh, and their brood nest. And it doesn't need to be anything fancy. There's no um, standard way of doing it. Can you go into a store and buy something like that? You can this? absolutely go into a store and buy something. Um, and depending on how much you want to spend, uh, you can buy something uh, really fancy, uh, too fancy even maybe. But um, beekeeping really is something that is simple and affordable and anyone who wants to should definitely be able to do it. And the wealth of product that you get from this inexpensive I don't know if you want to call it hobby, mm -hmm. but backyard beekeeping. Uh, honey prices have gone up so much because mm -hmm. of um, hive collapse. Can you tell us a little bit and have you experienced any hive collapses? Mm -hmm. um, each winter time, I experience some colonies that don't survive the winter, which is uh, somewhat normal. Most beekeepers sustain um, about a 20% uh, mortality rate in the winter time uh, overall of their colony numbers. Um, so that is to be expected. Now the last few winters have been harsher than normal, so I, I experienced quite a few um, more losses than that. Um, and what was the first part of your question? Um, and then how do you replenish your hive if a uh, gotcha. hive has collapsed? Well, um, I catch hives, I, I catch swarms of bees, and I cut hives out of um, places where they should not be, like people's houses. Um, and I, that's how I get my bees. So I'm basically replenishing my stock with uh, feral or, or wild bees uh, rather than purchasing them. Awesome. Now, one thing I, I'm so excited. My grandmother was a beekeeper, so I grew up around hives. I love the smell of fresh honeycomb. I love the taste of mm -hmm. fresh honey. Um, talk about the ordinances, because mm -hmm. I think it's a misconception, but it is legal to have hives within the city limits. Mm -hmm. And how do you go about obtaining, mm -hmm. what's the best way? Do you talk to your neighbors and let them know, right. inform and educate them about right. bees? And uh, in the city of Canton, um, there is no ordinance against having bees. In fact, um, there, there is beekeeping mentioned um, in city rights. So every person has a right to have bees. The only time uh, beekeeping uh, would become restricted by the city is if the bees uh, themselves became a nuisance to the neighbors, which is why it's always good to have good neighbor relationships um, anyway. Um, and hopefully, um, you know, your, your neighbors won't uh, complain. And we, we like to give our neighbors a few, uh, a few jars of honey every once in a while to kind of keep them happy. Me. Right. <laughs> but also realize that it's good for their gardens as well. It will help pollinate any backyard garden that they have exactly. going on. So it's beneficial to the whole community when we have bee hives in, right. our, in our backyard. Exactly. So we have hives here. Now this mm -hmm. one looks a little bit different. Mm -hmm. My grandmother had this style. Can you explain the difference between these two sure. types of hives? Sure. Absolutely. Um, the square looking hive with the stacks of boxes is called a Langstroth hive. And that's what um, here in the United States we've been using um, for most of our beekeeping history, um, at least in the last 100 years. Um, the sizes in those boxes, the sizes of the frames um, that have the honeycomb are uh, more or less the same throughout the United States. Um, so a beekeeper out in California could come here and their frames would fit exactly in, in these hives. Um, so the advantage to these Langstroth hives is um, all the parts are the same size and you can interchange them rather easily. Um, the, down, the downside of, of those types of hives is uh, they are more expensive um, to, to purchase than uh, this hive on my left, which is a top bar hive. 
Um, it was invented in Kenya, and it was made um, to help beekeepers who have fewer resources, um, but perhaps a little bit more time. Um, it can be made uh, by hand. I made that one uh, with just a few basic carpentry tools and it does not have complete frames. It instead, as the name would suggest, just has bars which the bees use to make their comb. Okay. Um, the advantage to that is it's cheaper. Uh, when you talk about cost, mm -hmm. what, how much would it cost to build a hive like this versus mm -hmm. a hive like? Well, um, a complete Langstroth hive, new, uh, like in a, from a catalog, uh, would probably cost uh, $250, okay. um, and, and that would just be enough to kind of get started. Um, a hive like this top bar hive uh, can be made with everything you see there for probably around $60. Wow, that's a significant right. price difference. Yeah. So, um, what are some of the other tools and equipment that you'll need? Well, um, the number one tool of, of uh, any beekeeper is, is uh, going to be their smoker. Okay, as you've said, the smoker is the most important tool for any beekeeper. Mm -hmm. How does it work and what is its function? Well, um, it works with blowing air through um, basically burning material. Um, and this is just a bellows, and it blows air into the bottom of this can, um, in which I have uh, some dry grass that's uh, on fire. <coughs> and uh, yeah, sometimes we smoke ourselves a little bit. Um, so when closed, it, uh, it puffs out smoke just like that. And the bees think that, um, well, they think their environment is in danger. They think uh, there's a fire somewhere and they need to eat honey in order to travel. So that calms the bees. As they're full with honey, they become slow and lethargic, less likely to fly, uh, less likely to be angry. Okay, are we ready to open up one of the hives and which yeah. one do you want us to take a look at? Uh, well, since the Langstroth is the most popular hive in the United States, uh, we should check that one out Okay, first. sounds good. So the first thing we want to do is uh, give the bees a little bit of smoke. Uh, we don't have to overdo it, okay. but you just want to give them a few puffs, let them know uh, it's time to calm down. Do the bees begin to recognize you? Um, there's there's a lot of debate about that, and, and I really can't speak one way or the other um, as to if they recognize me. Um, I haven't had any of them come out and say, hi, Matt, and shake my hand, mm -hmm. but um, I do, I do notice that the bees are, are calm the more I work them. Okay. And I don't know if that's to recognize me personally or if it's just they get used to a human. Human being right. present. They glue everything down uh, very securely. So most beekeepers have a, a tool that's just a, a little pry bar okay. um, in order to um, separate some of the things in the hive in order to look. And I see that you're doing this without gloves even. Right. So you must feel pretty com comfortable working around. Exactly. Um, uh, gloves can prevent, um, they don't prevent the bees from getting mad, mm -hmm. but they can prevent some stings. Um, however, I found that gloves are an encumbrance because um, it's harder and slower to manipulate things in the hive. Okay. How often do you need to check on your hives? How time consuming is beekeeping? Um, it doesn't really need to be time consuming at all. Um, it's up to the beekeeper. Okay. Um, I, I like to check my hives um, in the in the summertime about once a month Oh, um, okay. as a rule of thumb. Um, and that's just to make sure they have enough room to place uh, this lovely honey, which is um, this portion of the frame up here. Um, as you can see, the bees coat. When they finish honey, they put a little layer, layer of wax okay. uh, right on the top. And now the rest of this frame, as you can see, it's, it looks wet. And it is. We're looking nectar. for honey right now. Um, and this hive has about 20%, or this frame is about 20% uh, finished honey, ripe honey, and then 80% unfinished nectar. And as I so often lament to the viewers, if you could smell this, smell that honeycomb and smell the honey. Right. It just has such a sweet fragrance. Right. So that's, uh, I've looked down in here and I've seen that um, 
this particular box on top here is mostly uh, the same 20% uh, honey, 80% nectar scenario. Um, and if I can pry off one box here, we can look at some uh, brood and some young bees that will be hatching soon. How long does it take for your hive to start producing honey? Well, um, again, there are many factors. Uh, weather, um, how many wildflowers there are in the area, uh, but <clears throat> generally um, it will take uh, several weeks to to even a couple of months before you will get honey out of a hive that you have just started. And of course that's uh, seasonal. Bees only produce when flowers are growing um, outside. So in the winter time they are only consuming honey. They do not produce any. Okay. So this is their source of energy. This is their Exactly. Food. Yeah. Honey is, honey is primarily made for bees consumption. However, they usually make a surplus um, and we humans can, um, if we're good stewards, go ahead and harvest some of that for ourselves. Now this frame also has um, a capped layer on top, but instead of honey, uh, this is mostly brood, which is uh, bees which are about to hatch. Are there baby bees in there? Those are baby bees uh, just underneath those caps, and within a couple of days, uh, they will emerge and go to work. Now this is such a beautiful thing to see. I really feel special that I get to see this because I am so worried about the bees dying off. And to see here we have some little baby bees regenerating, this is amazing. Exactly. Uh, and this, I didn't see the queen in this hive just in the last five minutes, but I know that she's doing a good job uh, because uh, this is almost wall-to-wall -wall baby bees, uh, which is a good sign of a, of a queen that's doing a really great job. Very nice. And doing a nice job, as we see, we're here in the city of Canton City Limits. It's possible to grow and to grow bees. and. Mm -hmm have honey this is just I'm so excited to be here today absolutely so um, that's more or less a uh, Langstroth hive um, and most beekeepers are, are very um, well versed in in manipulating a Langstroth hive uh, I'm just gonna go ahead and put this back see everything sticks Everything sticks because the bees do a really good job of sealing their hive. And I suppose that protects them from invaders. It and does. Bees yep. And they want to make bacteria mm -hmm. in there. Exactly. Not only does it protect the bees, but um, this glue, which is called propolis, uh, which you can see right here, and it's very hard to scrape off that the bees use to seal their hive has antibacterial properties that are good for humans. Oh, and awesome. many uh, people take it, uh, they just consume it, mm -hmm. and it's, it's very good for the uh, digestive system. And I know several people um, with Crohn's disease that are taking bee propolis uh, as a um, natural treatment. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Boy, there are just so many health benefits. Now we're going to talk about the health and beauty benefits of bees later on in the next segment with your wife, and I can't wait to hear all about that as well. We've got a little place set up front, in fact, for your little one is two years old, correct? Exactly, yeah. And he, uh, he loves bees. He points them out all the time. Uh, we, we like to stay with him when we're around the bees, just to teach him uh, to keep, uh, maintain a respectful distance to the bees. And for our viewers, how would you explain to them to be respectful of the bees' environment? Well, um, bees are naturally uh, pretty calm creatures. Uh, honeybees only have uh, one defense, and that is their sting. They only get to use it once in their life. When they do, they, then they expire. Um, so they, they use it very judiciously, and they're not just going to go out and try to get people. Um, so they only use it in defense. And what you want to think about is, am I presenting myself in a way that is a threat to these bees? In other words, um, am I you know, throwing rocks at them, uh, opening their hive without smoke? Um, you just want to be conscientious that, that you're not perceived as a threat to the bees. Um, and then they generally go about their business and don't bother you. Very nice. Mm -hmm. Thank you, 
using that. Sure. Uh, would you like to take a look at the other hive? Absolutely. Okay. So once again, same same concept, uh, same type of bees. We just want to introduce a little bit of smoke to calm them down. <clears throat> the lid is much bigger. Doesn't even look like it would be too difficult if you're handy with tools and wood right. to make yourself. Right, exactly. Um, and it's it's really not difficult. Um, and I did make this one myself. Um, in fact, I just put the bees in it uh, three days ago. Um, this was a cutout from a, a house that had some bees in it. They weren't supposed to be in the house, and so I simply opened up where the bees were and cut out their their comb oh, and then goodness. attached it with rubber bands as you can see to these top bars. Again, I just that's so beautiful. And are they acclimating to a hive compared to you know their wild environment? They are. In fact, within the last three days, um, they have begun to uh, glue with wax this uh, comb to this top bar. Um, and within a few more days time, they will actually chew through these rubber bands, uh, which will just fall away. And then it will just be beeswax connected to a top bar. Um, and this type of hive really mimics a bee's natural habitat anyway, uh, which is kind of like a hollowed out tree or stump in the, in the, in the forest. Oh, that's so beautiful. I feel so lucky to see inside there. How many bees make up a hive? Well, um, a hive that's about this big uh, could have approximately 50,000 bees in it. Okay. Um, so it's quite a few. Um, when you People who buy bees usually buy them by the pound. Um, so no, no one really counts bees like you would beans. Uh, but now you have some baby bees there. Exactly, yeah. We've got some more brood right here uh, that's going to hatch uh, probably within the matter of uh, a couple of days. Uh, and they will come out and replenish the supply of bees in this top bar hive. I am with Laura Carmony and owner of the Wholesome Hive. And you have something interesting here. We're separating the... What's, what are, what's working, happening here? Yeah, so up here is what we call a solar wax melter. Okay. And so we're taking the comb from the hive, from the beehive, um, after we get the honey out of it, and putting it um, into this box um, on top of some paper towels. Um, and once the sun hits it, the wax actually melts down through the paper towel into a Tupperware container underneath. And then the other gunky stuff, um, we can just compost and um, we don't need that, but we can use the beeswax and I use it in most of my products that I make as we'll see in a little bit. I and can't wait, I'm so excited to see that. And again, this is a really simple, anybody, I could put that together yes. to separate the wax from the leftover material. Exactly. And there's many methods to do it. This is just one that works well in the summer when it's hot outside. Um, but there's many different things that we do. This is just a nice one that can stay out of my kitchen. Yes. <laughs> and you're not heating up your kitchen or taking up space in exactly. there. Exactly. And again, these are all materials that we have laying around the house. So it's simple to build yourself. Now, can you tell me how do you get the honey out of the comb? Well, um, if it is in one of the um, typical hives that he was showing you, they have the frames and we have an actual extractor. And it's a big barrel looking thing that you put the frames into, they stand upright, and then there's a crank on it and you crank it really fast and the honey just spins right out. Um, before you put it in, I should mention, you have to cut off the, the cappings, is what it's called, where the bees um, create the wax layer. It's like a seal. Mm -hmm, exactly. And that's what Matt was trying to explain between the nectar and the um, honey. Uh, when it's honey, it's sealed with the wax. So you have to cut that off first, and then you put the frames into the extractor, spin it around real fast, and it all um, comes down, and then you can filter filter it as much as you want. Make it look pretty and, there. Mm -hmm, exactly. I'm so excited. I can't wait to go see some of the products that you're making. I love the health and beauty benefits of bees and bee products. 
I'm Carly McCarty, host of The Dining Diva, and again, my guest is Laura Carmony, and I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having us here today. Of course. Laura's going to tell us a little bit about the health and beauty benefits of bees and bee products. Okay, sounds good. Well, first of all, um, like she said, I am the owner of The Wholesome Hive, which is a homegrown company. Um, started with uh, my husband being the beekeeper, bringing home beeswax, and um, I said, well, I know there's something you can do with this. And so after some research, started making some products and giving them away as gifts and um, to family and friends, and everyone said, why don't you sell this? And at the time, I had just become a stay-at-home mom. So I thought, well, I don't like to just, you know, I like to have more things going on. So I uh, thought, well, hey, I'll try to start a side business. So, um, so this kind of just happened that way. So after, you know, I noticed that with using the beeswax, you use a lot of the same ingredients for making lots of different products. So I, just after experimenting with those things, I thought, okay, I'm going to try this. So what are some of the products that you make? Well, I have a lot of people asking what are my favorite products, which is very hard to answer because I use a lot of them every day. So for example... And she's gorgeous. This should be a testament of how well these products work. Oh goodness. Um, for example, I have always been addicted to lip balm and I actually told my husband that I do not want to make lip balm because I love Burt's Bees and I didn't want to switch because I knew if I made it then I would have to be using my own. Well, um, a lot of the commercially prepared lip balms contain chemicals used in making petroleum. Right, exactly. So my um, goal was to make a lip balm that would be similar, um, similar feeling and you know tasting on my lips. Right. but with less ingredients. So I'm, I think I'm pretty close. I love it. use it every day. It has some peppermint in it, so it is very cooling on the lips. And then I kind of evolved into getting into a um, more tinted lip balm as well, which I call lip butter. And that one's a little bit more chocolatey. It has cocoa butter in it. Um, that's kind of neat. The other thing I use every day is the deodorant. And um, this is just a cream that you can apply with your fingers or a makeup sponge. Um, it's something that you're still going to sweat, which it, it's good for you. Um, gets the toxins, toxins out of your body, body, but you don't smell bad afterwards. So I have converted many people, including my husband, <laughs> to this. <laughs> so that's exciting. The other neat thing about this one is that I... Um, Take a couple of different healing herbs, calendula and comfrey. Calendula is a really pretty yellow flower. It looks like this. And I have a bunch of it growing out in our front yard. And so I grow this every summer, dry it, and then soak it in olive oil for six weeks. And then um, combine it with all the other ingredients that are in here. Very so it nice. makes a really awesome concoction of um, stuff that's just really good for your skin. And you know where all of the ingredients have been grown and... Mm -hmm. It's all natural. Yes, I definitely try to keep good tabs on where everything's coming from right. and making sure it's coming from organic plants so you're not getting extra pesticides and Wonderful. different wow. things like that. So so awesome to have this you as a resource here in Stark <laughs> County. This is wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoy doing it. So, um, so yeah, that's... Um, those things. We also have a hand sanitizer spray, which I um, recently started doing, and this is just a blend of essential oils. They're all naturally antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, all that good stuff. And the best part is the base is a coconut oil, so it's moisturizing. Oh, very nice, because so, that's a problem with typical hand sanitizer. It's so drying on your skin. Exactly. Yeah. Would you like to try it? Yeah, let's try some. Just need one squirt and... Oh my goodness, it feels like lotion <laughs> on my hands. This can't possibly be hand sanitizer. It is. It is. And it's the smell. Again, if my audience can smell. <laughs> oh, it just smells wonderful. Yeah. And it's so soothing. Yeah, it's a this great This is not like mixture. any typical hand sanitizer. That's wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. Very nice. Um, I also do an insect repellent. And um, again, another blend of essential oils. The main one being um, lemon eucalyptus. And that's the one that the Center for Disease Control is saying is just as effective as DEET. Mm -hmm. So... That's pretty cool that, yeah, um, nice. that they're even recognizing that there's something natural out there that right. we can be using instead. Right. And I don't want to put chemicals on my baby. Exactly. So this is something that you could use even on small children. Exactly. Definitely. There, you can definitely do that. It doesn't stain clothes. It's not oily, so that's neat. Um, what else we do? A sea salt scrub that you just rub into your hands after you get them wet. Massage them in. It 
put, them on, put it on your feet. Very exfoliating. It's nice after a day's hard work. And then lotion bars. And these um, are just a different concept for applying lotion. Getting the back of your hand. Again, I know you just got moisture on there, but you just put it right onto your skin and it puts moisture right into your skin. So instead of having a big glob of lotion you don't know what to do with, um, it's just made, that's you know, very beeswax, coconut oil, shea that's butter. Yeah. And that's rosemary mint in there. Yeah. I use um, all essential oils um, to scent everything. And, you know, those come directly from plants and herbs, just the, um, the oils from them. So that's kind of cool. And, of course, I had to get into the beeswax candles. It smells better burning in the house exactly. than a beeswax candle. Yeah, so they have a natural honey scent, so I don't scent them. Um, so that's really cool. It sounds like, or sounds, it smells like you're baking. So that's cool. And um, they have a very long burning time. And they also um, tend to take toxins and um, dust out of the air. It's not going to dust your whole house, <laughs> unfortunately. It's not the magic cure, but, um, but it does naturally do that just because it, they release negative ions and all the dust and toxins are positive. And when they react, they take them out of the air. So it's a pretty, pretty neat thing. Um, very nice, and we're going to make something, one of these products today. Yes. What do you have to All show right. us today? Laura? So, over here, we have, um, I've already put all the ingredients in here to make lip balm. So basic ingredients that are in almost all of the products are um, beeswax, coconut oil, um, those are the two main ones. So. Um, we saw the beeswax outside being melted. When it comes through the paper towel, it will look like this. Um, sometimes there's a little honey on it too, so we'll wash that off. Um, but lick it off. <laughs> yeah, you can do that too. Um, so, so yeah, this is the beeswax that's coming right from our hives um, that we render. And then coconut oil um, is just so good for your skin. It's super I use moisturizing. It on my face as a moisturizer in the evening. I use it on my hair. Yes. I I can live without my coconut oil. Yeah, it's crazy. After you get out of the shower to put it on while your skin is still damp, yeah. you're hydrated for the entire day. Exactly. It is amazing. And it's also naturally antibacterial and antifungal as well. So. Um, and it has a natural SPF, so... I was going to mention that. <laughs> so it really does. You can wear that when you're going out by the pool. Mm -hmm. Put some coconut oil on and... Yeah, which seems sunlight. counterintuitive, right. but um, it does have a little, little SPF. Protection. So, yeah. And that helps in the um, lip balm and, and the salve and stuff as well. When you're putting that on your skin, then you're getting a little sun protection. And you have this in a double boiler here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so most things um, that have the beeswax, you have to melt everything together um, so that it all incorporates and you know you give it a few minutes um, for everything to melt together and then I pour it into the respective jars that they go into so for the lip balm I'll put it you can see all the lip balm tubes all lined up here and just pour it right into the into the top a lot easier than dripping it in yeah. <laughs> one by one um, so yeah like I said, coconut oil, beeswax, use a lot of shea butter, cocoa butter. Um, almost all my products have vitamin E. That's the only natural preservative, um, but it's also very good for your skin. Um, and then essential oils. Very so, nice. so how long do we need to leave this in our double boiler? Is it well, we now? will watch it, yep, and see how it goes. But it'll probably take... 10, 15 minutes for this size batch. Um, so in the meantime, we can also put together um, one of the hand sanitizers. Okay. Um, but actually this blend, it, it contains the same oils that they would use um, during the bubonic plague, the thieves would use. Okay. Oops. And, um, oh, I'm getting all tangled. Um, the thieves would use during the bubonic plague to go rob the graves of people that have died from the plague. Mm -hmm. So um, when they would apply these to their skin, they wouldn't get the disease, uh -huh. but they would go and get whatever. So um, it's just a really great blend that you can um, use for lots of things. Um, when I'm using essential oils too, I'm, I know that you have as well, you know, applying them to the bottoms of your feet, applying them 
you know, if you're using for congestion on your chest, any of the pinpoint areas, if you have a stomach ache on your stomach, excuse me, but the main thing is you want to dilute them with the carrier oil. You do. I carrier. learned that hardly. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> they burn. Yeah. They're very, very potent because they're coming directly from the leaves, the roots of the plant. And so um, they say one drop of peppermint oil is like 28 bags or tea bags of um, peppermint tea. Yeah. So it's crazy. Um, so, yeah, we'll just... Combine these. When I was pregnant with him, I just one of those rough days. I wanted to take a bath and relax. And I was supposed to put a drop or two of orange oil in my bath water. Oh, no. uh, but it's been a really hard day, and I just dumped it in oh, there. Oh jeez! And I got burns on the on my back. Oh yeah! And I couldn't rinse it off because it was oil, so it was mm -hmm. sticking. Oh, it was just horrible. Yeah. Yeah, you have to be careful with them. So any carrier oil, olive oil, coconut oil, almond oil, grapeseed oil, any of those are great. Be careful with almond oil, though, because it does have a strong scent itself, mm -hmm. and it will change the scent that you're going That's for. That's true. And this is just liquid coconut oil. They have a process to um, keep, it, keep it liquid, which is great for body care stuff. Just shake it up a little bit. And voila. And that would be nice just to keep by your desk while you're working and... Yeah, exactly. I have a lot of teachers that love it, a lot of nurses that love it. Um, yeah, it's just great awesome. to have on hand. Even, you know, when I take my two-year-old into the nursery, I'm like, okay, squirt your hands. <laughs> and he loves it. <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah. Nice. And again, very easy, simple to make. And it smells wonderful. It's healthy. You've got benefits, health benefits from the oils. Yeah. Very nice. Definitely. I hear it. Yeah, it sounds like here. the water is warm. So we can see that it's starting to melt down there. You can see the um, yellow. Um, so yeah, the wax is still going to need a little time. Um, some people like to buy wax that's already like shaved and then that will melt faster, but I prefer not to spend the time. Yeah. So Laura, tell us about the health benefits of honey itself. I've heard some wonderful evidence that it helps with allergies and if you're traveling to a new area that you're unfamiliar with, get some local honey from that area. It will help if you are susceptible to allergies. Yeah, the theory behind that is um, local honey will contain the local pollen from your area. So the pollen that's coming from trees and plants and things that give us allergies. Mm -hmm. So once you introduce that into your system, it's really helping to build your immune system and being used to um, that pollen. Now I can't say that as a, as a beekeeper, we're not allowed saying <laughs> that that's going to help your allergies. But I have a lot of people that get honey from us just for that reason. And now that you've mentioned it, we should also mention that they recommend not giving honey to children under two. Right. Um, I think that's changed in the past year or so because even when my son was small, it was just um, younger than one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so someone told me recently it's two now. But the um, the thought behind that is that um, you know it can contain listeria, which is a bacteria that human body or adult human bodies can can take and they it's fine and they don't even it doesn't affect them mm -hmm. but with little babies their um, immune system isn't quite ready for it yet okay so. what are some other benefits of honey well um, it's antibacterial um, and antifungal and so Besides just consuming it, if you have a wound, an open wound, if you have a burn, something like that, a lot of people um, historically have used it on their skin for um, medicinal purposes. Um, it also contains antioxidants. It's really good for your digestive system. It helps balance blood sugar levels. So people with diabetes, a lot of people will um, use honey as a substitute. Instead of that so, processed white sugar. Exactly. And you want to be careful to you, you want to make sure that you're getting, um, if you want all those benefits, that you're getting raw honey. And that basically means that it, um, 
to me, it means different beekeepers have different definitions, but to me it means that it's unheated, unpasteurized, just lightly filtered. Right, all of the heat kills all of those beneficial properties of Exactly. Honey. And you can usually tell, like you'll see little um, spots in the honey a lot of times, and that's just the pollen, the propolis, the wax. That didn't get quite filtered out, but that's really good for your body anyways. Right. So that's one thing you want to look for, um, is raw honey, because that is going to have all the benefits. When you heat it, um, you lose a lot of the beneficial properties. Just like when you're cooking vegetables, you know, if you eat them raw you'll get more nutrients than when you right. heat them up so there's still going to be some even if it is um, heated but not as much as if it hasn't been heated in the processing there's nothing more soothing when you have a sore throat or a cough than to just suck on a spoon of honey oh yeah it's comforting and it helps soothe that yep. sore throat that's the only cough syrup we use. <laughs> so that's um, neat. Also, um, just as a little educational side note, um, all raw honey will eventually crystallize. And a lot of people I've heard tell me, oh, my honey got all solidified and I threw it away. And I said, no. Oh, no, don't do that. Um, because it's actually still good. Um, you can melt it back down into liquid using a double boiler um, if you want it to be like that. But it also spreads easily on toast. Right. You can melt it in your tea. It's actually easier to handle, yes. I think. But um, but yeah, honey is one of the only things that does not have a shelf life. It is good forever as long as it has not um, had moisture in it. It will start to ferment if there's moisture in it. But very nice. Yeah. So many good things and good things to make with honey. How are we doing over here in our Let's double it double out. boiler? Getting closer now. You can see that the wax is getting smaller and um, melting. So we'll give it a couple more minutes and then we can pour it in there. Okay, I'm Carly McCarty, host of The Dining Diva, and we are going to finish making our lip balm here. So we've melted, we have honey comb wax. The wax. Mm -hmm. And we have coconut oil. Coconut oil. Shea butter. Shea butter. Vitamin E. Okay. And now we're going to add any time that you're making um, something like this at home and you're using essential oils, if it's being heated, you want to make sure you don't add the oil until um, it's removed from the heat or just that the um, burner's not on anymore because that can actually make it just evaporate into the air. So that's not really what you're going for. And this is peppermint oil. Um, just, you know, kind of more traditional lip balm scent, um, nice and cooling on the lips. And now we're just going to pour, try to be careful, but you know, pour it in here. And then you let this sit for, I usually let it sit for a few hours before I would take it out, but it um, it sets pretty easily. Do you need to refrigerate it, or can you leave it at room temperature? No, nope, leave it at room temperature. All right, so those are all poured in there, and I can actually, while this is still melted, just scrape this back into the tops to get all the benefit. And then once it starts um, setting, I can actually scrape it all off the top and remelt it and then um, so just real quick any. and then make, it'll probably, you know, this will probably make another lip balm tube. So um, that's kind of cool. I always like to try to be resourceful. <laughs> so voila, it's pretty easy, pretty Very nice. fine. Just have to have all the equipment and ingredients. Very nice. Thank you so much for having us today, Laura. Uh, we've learned so much about bees, keeping bees, and health and beauty products that you can make with bee products. Thank you for having us. It was a pleasure to be here, Laura. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. We're so fortunate to have the Carmonies here in Stark County with all of these wonderful products. And I know now you want to know, where can we find them? So, Laura, how do they get the honey and the lip balm and the hand sanitizers and all of your other products? 
Well, in the summer, you can find me at many farmers markets in the area. I do three different ones, uh, four different ones, three a week. Um, Wednesdays, um, Gervasi Vineyard has a farmers market um, from four to seven um, on Wednesdays. Thursdays is the Jackson Farmers Market that's at North Park in Jackson off of Fulton, and that's from three to six thirty. And then Saturdays, I do the Canton um, downtown one and the North Canton, so I switch between the weeks. Um, and those are both in the mornings from 8 to noon-ish. So um, you can find my whole list of where I'm going to be on my website, which is um, thewholesomehive.com. Very simple to remember. You can also like us on Facebook. I'm constantly posting of where we are, new products, new tips, things like that. Um, so like us on Facebook. And then once summer wraps up, we do a couple of different um, craft shows in the area. And then I also do... Um, um, in-home parties that I call natural know-how workshops and that's where we talk about um just how to convert your chemical household and skincare products to more natural alternatives. So that's kind of a fun thing just to get some friends gathered together and have a discussion. And um, I also present my products and you have the opportunity to, to get these. And then if you need to contact me, all my information is on my website. Thank you so much for having us, Laura. 